very warm welcome to our service together this morning. You are especially welcome if you are visiting us for the first time. It's lovely to have you here. Welcome to all of our regular members of St. John's. My name is Jane, I'm part of the church and it's my pleasure to host you this morning. In our service we are including time sharing bread and wine together in Holy Communion and you may like to have some bread and wine or juice to hand as we seek God together in bread and wine and in our service of worship. We're looking over these weeks at some of the wonderful promises that God gives us and this morning our Bible passage that we'll look at later reflects how we are called to humble ourselves before God and that he longs to hear our prayer and answer as we seek his face. So as we start together, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us. We humble ourselves before you. We turn away from things that are not worthy of you in our lives. Lord, we turn to you and we ask that you will meet with us and show yourself to us as we travel together in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's worship God together. Mark was able to meet with 
Henrietta Blythe of Open Doors, and here he's talking with her about some of the work that they're engaged in at the moment. Henrietta, it's great to see you, and um, with you. Uh, it's lovely to catch up with a friend. Henrietta, as CEO of Open Doors, um, uh, we are a supporting church, and we would love to hear um, a snapshot of what's going on around the world for persecuted Christians. Particularly, uh, we've all read in the papers about some of the stuff that's happening in India. Yeah. Um, and there'll be other desperate places. I wonder if you'd just be able to tell us a few stories, and then I want to ask what we can do to put our shoulder behind your uh, work. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Well, um, first of all, thank you for all the support and prayers because our supporters have blown us away with their generosity, been amazing. But the need in the field is massive. Yeah. And, you know, we've heard, for example, stories from India, as you say, where we know up to 70 percent of the Christians are Dalits. So by definition, they earn a daily wage. So lockdown has meant they can't go out. No money means no food. We heard from one of our partners that um, the team arrived actually in a pastor at a pastor and his wife's house. So the, the church leaders are really struggling because they live off the tithes from the congregation. So if the congregation has no money, nor do they. And this brother turned up at this house with some rations and the pastor turned to him and said brother if you had not come tonight my wife and I had decided to commit suicide because we have nothing and he'd got there just in time I mean extraordinary the way the Lord's directing people I heard a similar story from another Asian, Asian country where the team were distributing rations and the sort of food and soap and basic supplies and there was one family they couldn't get to and it was getting close to curfew. And, you know, in a lot of these countries, India, Pakistan, elsewhere, curfews have been imposed and everything. And they've zoned the districts into red, amber, green and so on. Anyway, this team um, is getting close to curfew. They were worried. And there was one pastor in his family who they hadn't reached. And they were debating, should we go tomorrow? Should we go tonight? They were really worried about the impact of their car arriving in the neighborhood and that that would draw attention to this guy and his family. Anyway, they just really felt that they had to go. They had to go that night. And so they managed to get there. And when they arrived at the house, the pastor and his wife were standing hand in hand outside the front of the house praying. Their kids were behind them in the house. And the pastor said to them with tears in his eyes, my wife and I were praying because we were like, Lord, we have nothing. We have no food for our children. We have nothing to give them help. And at that moment, the team turned up. And I just find it so moving. I know loads of people are praying for our persecuted church family at the moment. It's like the Lord's, the resource that we have isn't enough to meet the need. I mean, it, in India, there are hundreds of thousands of Christians in this situation, but the Lord's multiplying it up and he's directing our partners and teams to reach people and so on. So amazing stories. Another amazing story I heard um, from Pakistan was that there were these Christian nurses in the hospital and because of the persecution of Christians, they were being sent in to work with the COVID patients, but they weren't being given any protective equipment at all. And our partners there managed to get together two big packs, you know, of protective equipment and they sent it to the nurses and the superintendent of the nursing team rang them the following day and said it was just amazing to get that protective equipment and we're so grateful and we knew it came from you and you know please thank everyone for their support and everything and she said but the Christian cleaners were also being denied protective equipment so I hope it's okay but we gave them one of the packets so they'd actually split they didn't have any protective equipment but they'd split it with the cleaners anyway so that everyone would have some and that generosity another story that I think is actually in this in this month's magazine of in Sri Lanka 
the Christians in Sri Lanka have actually been giving food to the very neighbours who have been persecuting them over the last few years. They've actually recognised that their neighbours are in need and even though their neighbours have been against them, they've actually been sharing what they have with them. So we've had these extraordinarily amazing stories of how the Lord's moving, but also really heartbreaking stuff too. So how, how can we best support? I mean, it sounds as though there's a financial need, so I want you to ask, but how else can we support? Because not everybody uh, has that ability at the moment to support financially. Uh, and, and Henrietta, we obviously, you know, we, we've got food banks and soup kitchens and pop-up food banks, we've got lots going on in the area and um, how does our poverty compare with that that your your organization are dealing with around the world that's a really good question so i think um i think we're struggling here i think people are lonely i think people are really concerned for their livelihoods. We know so many people, particularly young people, have lost jobs. Uh, people haven't been able to worship together. People haven't been able to see their families. All these things are new for us, but they're exactly what the persecuted church struggles with daily and has done for years. And so I've been really blown away by the lessons I can learn from the persecuted church and what our brothers and sisters have learned over the years. Um, so in some ways, we're now in the same position as they're in, but in terms of our physical needs and the ability to get support, we're in a much better position. So we know that loads of Christians don't get food aid, even if it's being distributed, because it's distributed by local people who persecute Christians, who uh, don't want Christians to get it. So we've heard stories all over the place in Vietnam and in Pakistan and in India in Sri Lanka of Christians being denied food aid. Um, here there's a bit of a safety net for everybody but in many 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 of these Christian of these countries there isn't a safety net and even if there was Christians wouldn't get access to it. I heard one story in a country of uh, people being lined up to get food and they made two lines one of Christians and one of everyone else they gave the food out to everyone in the other line and then they told the Christians just to go home so incredibly humiliating apart from desperate so people do need food so we've had a campaign we've had an appeal for COVID asking people to give so that we can continue to provide basic supplies to all the Christians many of whom are close to starving. So it'd be great if people felt able to do that. And there's lots of information on our website. Um, we've also, we're just kicking off a campaign where we're asking people to contact their MPs about the discrimination against Christians in the distribution of aid. So we want the government to recognize that faith makes people vulnerable. And that even if aid is given, often Christians don't get access to it. So again, information on the website about that. But the most important thing, I mean, all of that's hugely important, but we just got to pray for them. Um, and, you know, the Lord's doing amazing things. I mean, we've seen it even in this country with more people joining church services online and everything. And people watch Christians. They watch the way they respond to persecution. They watch the way we love each other. They watch what's going on and they see Jesus in us and they come to know the Lord. So always they pray. They ask us to pray, help us to stand firm and help us to be salt and light in our communities so that people will come to know the Lord. And so I think praying for them and, and praying for the Lord to move in miraculous ways in these countries and amongst these communities is, is just really critical. Yeah. Henrietta, thank you so much. Just name your website. What's the web address? Oh, yes. Thank you. 
www.opendoorsuk.org. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here today and thank you for speaking to us as a supporting church. And um, we will be both praying and I hope giving as well to all that you're Thanks doing. Thanks so much, Mark. Thank you all. God bless you. Thank you, Henrietta, so much for that conversation. We love to hear any stories that you may have of God being at work that you want to share with us. Do get in touch. We'd love to share those on this wider platform. Now we're going to join in bread and wine together and Mark is going to lead us. As we come to celebrate communion, I thought it would be really lovely on this weekend when everything is opening up a little bit more to celebrate from St John's Church, this place that we know and love together and uh, where we're longing to be reunited, that we don't just celebrate um, in a distanced way online, but where we're able to gather for proper fellowship and community. I hope you've managed to get some bread and wine or juice to be able to celebrate communion with me today. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give you thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you've created all things and who was sent by you and your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh and as your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and one for you, a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. And he gave it to them saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so far, according to mind, his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people in each and every home today and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup so that we in the company of all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord by whom and with whom and in whom in the unity of the Holy Spirit all honour and glory be yours almighty Father forever and ever. Amen. And as Jesus our Saviour taught us so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share 
in one bread. So draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. And so we do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We're not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. The gifts of God are given for the people of God. Let's receive our bread and our wine or juice at home as we celebrate this communion together, corporately, in our dispersed way. And as we do so, we're going to be led in some worship. Let's give thanks to God together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies 
to be a living sacrifice. Strengthen us in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. I'd love to share some news with you. Um, you may uh, have heard that the church is going to be open a couple of times in the week. If people are able and feel comfortable, would like to come in, they, the church building will be open between 12 and 2 on a Tuesday and a Thursday. There's a display helping us pray for some of our mission partners and you may like to come in at that time. Uh, we need to keep a record of who's been there and you can do that simply through our website or calling the office and we'd love to welcome you there if you'd like to be in the church building and find that helpful. Also, uh, just to remind you that on a Wednesday morning uh, on our channel, video channel, we share in communion together midweek and you would be so well, well, welcome to join that midweek or come uh, and catch up later just as a chance to be with God together in the week. And now um, Val is going to lead our prayers. After that, we're going to have our Bible reading. And then we're really um, delighted to welcome Chris Fox as our guest speaker this morning. Chris is the Associate Vicar at our Friends at St Paul's. Thank you, Val. Let us pray. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. King of kings and Lord of lords, we come to you this morning to bring you the needs of our broken world. Thank you that you are a listening God who delights to hear our requests and completely gets our struggles and concerns. We bring to you the coronavirus pandemic and ask again that an effective vaccine may be found quickly. As we emerge from lockdown and gain more freedoms, please help us to act sensibly and wisely so that a resurgence can be avoided. We pray for your help in facing the devastating effects of loss caused by this virus on so many. And we ask you, Lord, to help us to bring hope and encouragement wherever we go, especially praying for those black in lockdown in Leicester. We pray for aid organisations at this time, facing severe cuts, and particularly lift to you the work of Tear Fund and World Vision, as they seek to prioritise their resources amidst a vast sea of need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring to you the church as we reopen our buildings all over the country. Thank you that the message of Jesus is the most powerful message in the world, transforming society, changing lives and offering reconciliation. We ask you to help us to continue the journey within the church that Black Lives Matter has started and to listen more carefully to the stories of our black brothers and sisters to understand better the need for white people to speak up. We pray for our archbishops, the General Synod, the Archbishop's Council, and for all those influencing and implementing policy, that we might be bold in challenging the assumptions that cause so much hurt and disparity in our land, and which grieve your heart of love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we bring to you our own church family, thanking you for its diversity and the gifts with which you've equipped each person. We thank you that Alpha Online worked so well and that those seeking you met with Jesus. We pray now that each person will grow in faith day by day. We bring to you those amongst us who are currently dealing with uncertainty, those undergoing medical treatment, and those who are struggling with anxiety and depression, loss, loneliness, disappointment, or stress. We ask for your help for those we know working on the front line facing overwhelming pressures, as well as those who are parenting alone. Let's silently name those known to us before God now. May we all cry out to you day by day, Lord, that we may know your power being made perfect in our weakness. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear all these prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The reading is taken from 2 Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Well, it's great to be with you. Uh, one day soon, hopefully, I can be with you again in person. But until that point, it's lovely to join you online. Um, if you don't know who I am, I'm Chris. Uh, I'm one of the pastors at St Paul's Church. Uh, and uh, I do a little bit of serving around some of the family of churches of which we are all part. Uh, before I look at this passage uh, this morning, why don't we pray together? Father, I thank you that you speak to us. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that we would hear your voice through your word, by your spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. When I turned 17, in fact, the very day I turned 17, I was desperate to get behind the wheel of a car. All I wanted to do was learn to drive and have some more freedom. And so I had copious amounts of lessons and practices before I finally got the opportunity to take my first driving test. Yes, my first and not my last. Now I know for some of us who fail our first test, it's a minor fault here and there, one too many little mistakes that we've made, or maybe we had a bad day and we might have made a major fault, you know, the X in the box. Uh, unfortunately for me, on my first driving test, yes, I did several minors, enough to fail. I had several majors, I think three, maybe four, and I also had one dangerous, that's a D, and I just avoided a second by putting the brakes on. So I managed to fail spectacularly, and I just remember being back at the test centre, uh, driving test centre, and the examiner turning over to me and saying, uh, Chris, I'm really sorry, but you failed. I already knew that I'd failed by that point, and I got home, and I was gutted, and the next morning I was gutted, and I didn't want to get back in the car. But my mum, my mum is amazing. She got me back in the car that very day to face my fears and to get back on track, and I can tell you I only had one more test after that. Um, I wonder what our response is to things when we get it wrong. Do we run away? Do we freeze or panic? Do we get angry and mad? Uh, or do we, like my mum made me do, um, face the challenges that uh, we are going through? You know, what do we do when plans are changed and when they are out of our control? When we suffer loss or grief? When we mess up and make mistakes, what is it that we do? You see, at this moment in our, the story we heard read this morning from Second Chronicles chapter 7, this is the high point for the people of Israel. They have uh, a settled land, peace in their land. They have wealth. They have influence. They have a king who is respected around the world, they, the known world. They have, uh, as I said, wealth. They have a, now have a temple. And the consecration service for the temple that just took place was the most incredible uh, act of worship, as it were. Um, the spirit of God filled that place in power. The glory of God fell. Uh, the sacrifices were accepted and God promised to inhabit that temple, to be at the center of his people. But now the party is finished and everyone's gone home and, and it's just God and Solomon late at night. And then God speaks to Solomon and says this, you know, the party won't always last. You know, if there's a time that's, if a, if, if a time comes where there's no food, where there's drought, where there's starvation, where there's plagues, um, what will your response be? When things go wrong, whether that's because of your sin, or whether that's because just life can be cruel sometimes, natural disasters can happen, tragedy can strike us. What will your response be? And God tells Solomon this, if my people, my God-defined people, respond by humbling themselves, praying, seeking my presence and turning their backs on their wicked lives, I'll be there ready for you. I'll listen from heaven, forgive their sins and restore their land to health. It's an amazing promise. 
we find ourselves in a significant moment in history. Uh, certainly for us, probably the most significant moment in our lifetimes. We're in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you know, all around the world has been affected by this illness. It's far from being over. We've been facing a climate crisis for a long time now, and many parts of the two thirds world are already suffering the effects, the devastating effects of that. And our economy, the, the economy of the Western world, the global economy is facing a severe recession. And that means that some of us are facing really uncertain futures. It might be um, our, our jobs are at risk of possible unemployment, or loss of income. Maybe our health isn't good. Uh, maybe we've lost loved ones and we're facing grief and bereavement. Maybe we've not been able to go back to school or to university. Our plans have been changed. Uh, our mental health has suffered um, and our relationships have broken down. Maybe home has been really challenging over this season. This season of life, maybe it has taken and is taking its toll upon us. And the passage says this, that when we face a season where everything is shaken, and in the passage, God speaks to Solomon about starvation, a lack of food, drought, a lack of water, and plague, the loss of crops, you know, their livelihood, their land being ravaged. When we face that, uh, this, is the, this is what the passage tells us. When God's people pray, God promises to heal our land. When God's people pray, God promises to heal our land. In other words, our personal trials and challenges, when we bring them to God uh, and pray, he hears us and he comes down, he comes to us. When the people of God, that's us, call out to God, God hears us, forgives us and heals our world. So when God's people pray, God promises to act. Let's look at this in a bit more detail. If my people who are called by my name, we need to remember not who we are, but whose we are, that we belong to our heavenly father. Jesus told a story about a son who ran away from his father. We know the story of the parable of the prodigal son. The son disgraced himself and his family, squandered every bit of money he had, uh, and then suddenly hits rock bottom, finds himself in an utter mess. And you know, what's his response? It's to turn back and head home hoping to see his father. He expects to be made a slave. He expects to earn his father's favour and love, but he hasn't uh, totally understood who his father is. His father has been waiting for him, watching for him, and he runs to him and he embraces him and he kisses him and he welcomes him and he's thrilled that he's there and he celebrates him and he throws a party for him. That is how God responds to us. We might not have prayed for 40 years, but the second we turn back to God, God celebrates us and welcomes us home. You know, God responds to us like the father responds to the prodigal son in the story of Jesus. If my people who are called by my name, we are his. If they'll humble themselves and pray, you know, heartfelt prayers come from humility. Humility isn't thinking less of ourselves, it's thinking of ourselves less. Um, it's, we come to God with a recognition that we can't fix everything, that we don't have the strength. In fact, actually, the times when we come desperate and, and, and hoping and crying out to God, that's the moment when uh, Jesus said in the Beatitudes that we're blessed. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they'll inherit the earth. Humility comes in seasons like this where we can't fix things, where we can't do what we normally would do. And we have to humble ourselves before God, be grateful to him for what he's given us and ask him for his help. Maybe our pride stops us from doing that, but actually it's, it's so necessary. And the key thing for us to do is to humble ourselves, to humble ourselves before God. God, we need you. I can't do this on my own. And then it's to pray. You know, we, we might feel that God is calling us to a season of prayer. I think it's the best thing we can do to respond to all that's happening in our world. It's a positive response. It's a, it's a, a kind of taking ground response. It's an advancing uh, response. It's, it's, it, it will enable us to give something to our world as we call upon our heavenly father. He will move and act in our world. You know, I've heard stories recently of people walking around our streets, praying blessing over every home, running around hospitals and uh, not literally inside them, but running around them as part of their daily exercise and praying blessing on our key workers. 
you know, making time and space to pray for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done in our community, in our politics, in our local council, uh, for all of our emergency services, for our economy, for our um, different business sectors, for our environment. We're praying, God, let your kingdom come. And, and, and the Bible's really clear. Jesus said that if we call on out to God for justice, he'll see it comes quickly. But we also want to pray for ourselves. God, let your kingdom come in my life. Transform me by your spirit. Fill me with your presence. You know, begin renewal and transformation in me that you might do something through me. You know, I know that um, each, if I don't spend time with God each day, after a few days, I really notice. Because God wants to constantly be at work in my life. And, you know, I know when I always turn back to God, he always welcomes me. He's always there for me. And I want to encourage us today, if we've not prayed that God would transform us, if we've not asked God to fill us with his Holy Spirit, his holy presence, to renew us, if we've not turned away from those things in our lives that might get in the way of our walk with God, why not take some time this morning or whenever you're watching this just to do that? We can join with others to pray. We, we might be able to attend a prayer meeting online or gather in a small group, a growth group or a life group, whatever it might be. We can pray as a family around the table, maybe five minutes, maybe just last thing at night with those we live with or first thing in the morning with those we live with. We get praying. We seek God. We, we think this is the season to do just that. And finally, in this passage, God says, I want my people to turn from their wicked ways. This is about repentance, is that God, God, as we pray, works on our hearts. Repentance means change of mind, which leads to a change of action. Um, prayer always leads to action. I mean, what actions do our prayers demand? If we're praying for forgiveness for something, is there something we need to do to put things right? If we're praying to forgive someone else, do we need to do that? If we've hurt someone or there's a relationship that needs repairing, do we do something about that? If it's about injustice, can we be the answer to the prayer that we're praying? Can we give? Can we campaign? Can we serve? Can we act? Because if we do this, if we, his people who are called by his name, humble ourselves and pray and turn from our wicked ways, then God promises that he'll hear our prayers, that he'll forgive our sin and he'll heal our land. I think what we need more than anything else in our world is for our our hearts to be forgiven and our land to be healed. And God says to his people, to you and me, would you play your part in that? Would you join with me? Would you, uh, as it were, co-create this new future that I want to bring my kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven? You know, we see in the Bible, we see throughout history that when God's people pray, God acts. I love the story of the Hebridean revival. Two old women uh, in their 80s begin to pray. They can't get to church for a number of reasons, but they pray and they pray and they gather one or two others and they gather the church leaders. And then the spirit of God comes in power and and and, and, and so many people are converted on those islands. That was only in the 1950s. Remarkable revival. Maybe if two or three of us begin to call on his name, begin to humble ourselves and cry out to God for his kingdom to come. Who knows what God might do? You know, we can gather with others to contend in prayer for a new future. We can can shape what is to come by our prayers. Walter Wink, uh, the author and theologian said this, that history belongs to the intercessors, those who see and pray the future into being. Friends, let's press into prayer in this moment. Let's do that. Let's make space for prayer. Let's believe that God hears our prayer. Let's return to God if we've not prayed for a while. We don't need to worry about the words that we say. It's more putting ourselves in a place where God can work in us and through us. So as we come to the end of this talk, I'd love to pray for us that God would fill us with his spirit, would move in power in our lives, and would use us as a praying people to see his kingdom come and will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heavenly Father, thank you that when we ask for your spirit, you give it to us. So I pray in our homes right now, come Holy Spirit, set our hearts on fire with love for you. Uh, Stir in us a passion to pray. Help us as we pray. Holy Spirit, lead us as we pray. 
that, Father, we would see you come and hear us and heal us, forgive us and transform our world. Because, Lord, we need you. We so desperately need you. So we pray you'd come and act in Jesus' name. Amen. You give life, you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, you give life. final prayer together. The peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. We'd love to welcome you if you'd like to head on over to the Zoom and we will share coffee and conversation together. God bless you.